Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I'm Christian. I'm uh, working on the Kotlin notebook teams here at JetBrains and I wanted to show you something about Compose inside uh, notebooks we have been working on. Uh, but that was easy, that is easier to show inside uh, the IDE, so I'll jump to that straight away. Uh, so let's see, we can get it full screen so everyone can see it. So hopefully most of you are familiar with how a multi-platform project looks by now. So like this is just a normal Gradle project. Um, so a notebooks are this new file format that allows you to to mix code and, and documentation. And you can create these files anywhere. So let's create one inside uh, this folder. Uh, name it anything. And then hide this one. Uh, so the first thing we want to do for to work with Compose inside this file is that we want to change the run mode to run inside the IDE process because that allows us to, to have a more, uh, uh, more rich output model, which we need for Compose. And then we want to use the project we are working in uh, as a dependency because there are some things we need uh, later in the presentation. So once you have that set up and running, then if you don't know, like the notebook itself is just a mix of, of code and documentation. So you can take any cell, then you can write, um, you can write uh, Markdown in it um, and have it rendered as Markdown. Uh, or you can write code like this. Uh, have it compiled, um, and then it will display the output directly inside the notebook, right? And that's so you can sort of experiment with from there, and you have all the, the normal cut and APIs available. So then how do we bring Compose into this? Uh, for that, we use something called library integrations. And it uses this special use syntax. Um, so we have a new one here called Compose, which basically brings in all the desktop dependencies for Compose, as well as setting up a bunch of uh, implicit imports, so we don't have to do that all the time. So if we compile that, uh, it, it has to fetch these dependencies from the internet, which was thankfully pretty fast this time around. Uh, and now we have Compose available. So then how do we uh, then start using it, right? And then that, from this point on, you can basically write normal Compose code. Uh, it looks like this, right? We have a simple Composable. Uh, it's a button that has some text, and then we can compile it. So the first time we compile it, like you can see there's a green uh, checkbox here, which means it did compile, but nothing was shown. And that is because we need a bridge between the Compose world and the, the notebook output. And that is, that is coming through these special closures, uh, this one called Compose. So anything we write in here will actually be rendered uh, in the notebook itself. So let's say we do that, uh, like here. You can see suddenly we have this Compose output here, and it is actually interactive. And you can probably guess, OK, this is actually pretty flexible right now. You can write any sort of Compose code and have it immediately seen and try to experiment it with, that way. Um, and because we also depend on the project, we can actually also just use the composables from inside our project. So in this case, uh, I, have this, uh, I have this dialogue I've been working on. And if I compile that, you can see that also renders immediately. So this is my, I have a small side project where I'm working on a board game, so this is from here. Um, and then, like, if I let, let's say I have a use case where I want to experiment with the colors of this dialog, then uh, that is where, like, notebooks are really valuable because you have this really fast feedback, feedback loop. So, in this case, I went to the internet, I found a website that could uh, give me a bunch of different colors to play around with, um, and downloaded it. It came in the form of a JSON file. And because this is a notebook, I have all the, like, normal cut and APIs available, right? So, we can just read the file like this and see what it looks like. Um, so in this case, it's a JSON blob or JSON object. It has a bunch of properties, like, okay, apparently there's 148 colors, and they come in this array where there's a name and some properties around it. And here's how the colors are defined, right? And the long value here is someone is something Compose understands, so that's the one we want to extract. Um, and this is where we can use another one of uh, the notebook integrations, which is with serialization. So we can pull in serialization like this, um, which will download serialization and in, embed the, the compiler plugin as well. And behind the scenes, that now enables us to read a JSON file, and then uh, this uh, integration will automatically detect the schema of the file and make it uh, like visible in a, in a type safe manner. So let's do that. 
So it looks like this. So this special method here, which is what does all the magic behind the scenes, and then we output it just to see how it looks like. So you can see here, now it's actually the exact same form, whoops, it's the exact same file, uh, but now they are like highlighted because there are types behind them. And that means now we can start going into the file. So you, like you can see down in the next cell, we actually have the, we have the, the variable available and we can actually go into it and, and find the things we want. Um, so in this case, uh, I have, let's see, yeah, we have this, this function here. Uh, so I'm creating a data class to extract the data I want. Then I, I select the colors and then just map them through this data structure so we can work further with it. And you can see here, okay, that is, uh, that is an array and it has the titles and it has the colors. And of course, like trying to reason about colors as numeric values isn't that much fun, so we should probably try to find a way to render it. Uh, and this is where we again can just jump back into Compose create a simple box that takes a random color just to test, and then we create a box with a background color and then just write the, the title of it as well, and then we render it. So you can see it here, um, where it's okay, it might be blue, but it can be triggered to see on the, on the background. So we can change that just like this. Uh, if my fingers will do the right thing, just like this. Let's try to make it white, so we can reason about it. And you can see, yeah, it is actually slightly blue, right? So, um, so but of course, we, just, we don't want to do this for all the colors. We, want to, we just want to see all the colors at once. So let's do that. Uh, for that, we can use, uh, in this case, I'm creating a new composable, uh, making it a flow row, which is really good at just laying these kind of things out. And then I want to store like the, th the, the, the current color I have selected. Now we just need to find a way to actually render each color, right? Um, and for that, uh, let's just create another box like this. Uh, so it, it's similar to the other box. It's, it takes the input color uh, and then it responds to it if it's selected, but otherwise it just renders it in a nice way. So now we just need to hook those two together. Like this. And if we render it again, now we actually have a full color selector, right? Of course, like then there, there's a default size to this out to this to the size of the output, so which is a bit small in this case. So we can also increase that, uh, like this, and now we have all the colors from the file directly inside the notebook. Of course, this is sort of apparently laid out uh, alphabetically, which like doesn't look that nice to me. So we should probably try to try to sort them like more like we would see in a color selector. <laughs> Um, and we can do that. So I cheated a bit and added a helper method to my project that can give you the hue saturation values for the color, which gives you a more natural view of the colors. And then we just sort them by that instead. And then I just need to replace it down here. And if we render it again, you can see now suddenly we have a color selector that looks rather nice. And now we just need to hook that into our product dialog so we can play around with them. Um, Mm, and we do that for this smaller helper. So yeah, we just create a box, so we, the, the dialog has somewhere to be, and then we hook the selected uh, color and the title into it, so it, it will actually show what's happening. And if we, co if we uh, compile that again, the default was transparent, which looks correct. And then if we start selecting these, uh, suddenly, yeah, you can actually, you can see how easy it is to sort of play around with, okay, now I've, I, may, I might find a color I really like for my project, right? So, but you are not only restricted to doing all of this inside the, the notebooks. Uh, because we are just running Kotlin code, you can also just launch the app as normal. Uh, if you have written any sort of multi-platform desktop project, you probably know this code. If you have an application closure, it will just launch it as a normal application. The only thing to be aware of is that this exit process on exit uh, is normally true. And because we are running inside the ID process, if it was true, you would actually kill the IDE, which you normally don't want. Um, so we set it to false, and then once we launch it, uh, now you have the you have actually have the full application as as you would normally see it, right? And it still works as as before. And then here we can also play around how it looks once you start scaling it. 
Um, so when once you then have a color you, you, you kind of like, uh, then, oops, wrong button. Then you can also take screenshots of it. Uh, let's move this down. So here. Uh, so we have also added this helper method that can take a screenshot of any composable and embed that screenshot into the notebook for like um, for the documentation. So in this case, we define the background color and the height of the image, and then like we select one of the colors, uh, and then we render it. And you can see now it embedded an image of that composable inside the notebook, and it's no longer interactive, it's just a plain image. And the reason that that can have value is, for example, notebooks are something you can share on GitHub, for example. So we press this button, share it, uh, it will upload it to GitHub. Um, and because GitHub has renderers for notebooks, you can actually see that it will display the image on GitHub directly, and as well as all the code cells you just had. So that means that this is a really easy way to sort of share what you're working on with other people without them having to do much, right? You can just export a gist and then they can see what's happening. Um, so yeah, so I think that's sort of the end of the demonstration and hopefully that sort of uh, gives you an idea on how quick you can iterate on ideas inside a notebook uh, without, with very minimal setup. Uh, so if we go back to the presentation, uh, let's share. So um, you might ask yourself, why do we need other ways to work with Compose? We already have quite a few, right? So the first one is, of course, like for simple things, you can just run an app, and that works perfectly fine for both Jetpack and multi-platform. It only requires your normal project, uh, and then it works fine. Of course, that approach doesn't scale that well as soon as you have any sort of complex app. Uh, it, getting to the thing you want to test is, is going to get harder, it's going to take longer, and then suddenly you have login screens, and then it's, it turns into a nightmare. And that is where you start to looking for other solutions, right? Now, the first of these solutions is, of course, the preview uh, annotation, which has been around for a number of years, and it works fine. Um, the problem, of course, is that it only works for static data, um, which means that there is a limit to how much you can actually experiment with the thing you are trying to, to take a look at. Uh, and this, of course, brings us to hot reload, which we saw, just saw at the keynote which is like probably closer to this quick iterative uh, loop you, you have, you want to have. Of course, it does require you have to have an existing app, an existing project, um, and like there are probably limits to how much you want to mess up your existing project, right? Um, and this, I think this is where Kotlin Notebooks has the advantage, is that if you just want to have quick throwaway experiments, if you want to mess around with things and not be afraid to break your entire project, uh, this is where notebooks really shine. So this is where like, you have this interactive playground you can do anything with, and then you can share it as well. And it also has the advantage that, um, that it doesn't require a, a project at all. Like You can just create a notebook from the front page of IntelliJ without even st starting a project. Um, so what's the current status of this? Um, so I would have liked to stand here and say, oh, it's ready today, you can download a preview and it's working. Uh, that was the idea I had when I proposed this talk in December, and then the real world hit, and yeah, it's still in development. Um, so we had a few problems on the way. So uh, while it, the, the code is, is, uh, is available, it, you have to custom build a number of components for it to work, so yeah, I wouldn't advise it. And one of the reasons is that, that we are still migrating uh, the notebooks from uh, the K1 infrastructure to the K2 infrastructure, and that has gotten delayed a little bit, unfortunately. Uh, so like, if you're interested in this, like here's the, the U-Track issues you can follow along for. Um, and one of the key issues we still need to solve is how to di actually distribute uh, the runtime for Compose, because like, it, it depends on Skia, which is quite a big binary, and we don't want to like, embed all the different platforms in that. So we still need to figure out how to do that. Um, so yeah, so the takeaway for this is basically that, as you saw, no notebooks are free in both uh, IntelliJ, in all variants, and Android Studio. So you can, act, you can play around with this, uh, at least uh, notebooks, today. Uh, the Compose support are still in development, uh, but yeah, we can definitely see an end to it, so we'll be here soon. Uh, and if you can see any sort of use case in your project for it, like you can also just have it as in, inside your uh, normal, if you have like uh, some, uh, data analysis you're doing that wants to use Compose, uh, please come talk to me. We would really like to hear about your use cases just to make sure that they're covered. Um, 
So if you think the compose support is interesting, uh, the same thing does work for Swing. If you want to write Swing code, that does work today. Uh, so I guess not many do, but it is possible. Uh, and this presentation is available uh, on GitHub, so you can find the code and, and the screenshots there. Uh, and then there's a few links um, if you want to know more about notebooks. So I think this was it. So thank you, everyone, and don't forget to vote in the app. <laughs>